Welcome back to the Dallas Prospect. It's a new day and another shot at the title here. Today we're talking Dallas's 120-109 victory over the San Antonio Spurs. This was a really interesting game to see, not just because it's the first game of a new season, not just because it's coming off of a season in which you got to the NBA Finals, but specifically because it's a new era for the Mavericks. How is it a new era in a sense when you already have your top two guys locked in? The dynamic brought to the table by Klay Thompson is simply something that we've not seen in the Luka Doncic era in Dallas. Having one superstar pairing with Kai is huge mammoth. We saw how that transformed the team last year, particularly with the emergence of Derek Lively and the trade deadline acquisitions of PJ Washington and Daniel Gafford. That's legitimate. But the new dynamic you bring to the table with Klay Thompson, while that did raise some eyebrows and skeptics around the league, in fact, they're still there, including uh, notable names like Charles Barkley after the game, still saying he sees Dallas somewhere between six and eight in the Western Conference. Wild take, by the way. I look at this and say, what can we anticipate as far as the fit? People question, like, is Klay washed? They're really remembering his stretch post post all-star break last year where he started to taper off and he had some really ugly performances. People said like, well, Dallas's lack of off ball movement and it's superstar heavy ball dominance by Luca and Kai probably means that's not going to be an ideal fit. Now, again, these are the same people that had he ended up in LA with LeBron would have had no such criticism. Just putting that out there first and foremost. In this debut for Klay Thompson, the first thing, the obvious thing to point out, not only does Dallas, despite a very rough, rusty offensive start for the first half, still pour in 120 points, but Klay Thompson sets a Maverick franchise record with six made threes in his debut game. That is really nice, especially when you consider, I want to say he was six of 10, and he really only took two threes that I felt were just forced. The kind of threes that you look at and you're like, I know you're Clay Thompson. I know it is very fair to make a, a claim that you're maybe the second most accurate three-point shooter in NBA history. But man, that's a heat check moment or a peak prime Clay attempt. And uh, not there, man, not there. So... Maybe that's a little bit pressing early on, but even still, I really liked what we saw from Clay. Not only do you get the six made threes, you get some quality defense from him as well. You're able to get, what is it here? 22 points overall out of him. And you get seven rebounds and three steals. Like, not only that, you saw him matched up with Wimby at times. The Mavericks were throwing a lot at Wimby in terms of matchups. In fact, in the first 14 minutes, as Nick Angstad points out on Twitter, Wimby saw defenders of PJ Washington, Daniel Gafford, Maxi Kleba, and Derek Lively. Like I said, there were also moments where he matched up with Clay, and Clay got a rip, I think, at one point early on of Wimby, too. So just phenomenal, phenomenal stuff there for, for Clay for the debut. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that first half. I said early on, some people were kind of joking like, ah, oh, you know, Luca misses the entire preseason. And yeah, man, he's locked in defensively. Like some of the stuff he's doing defensively is legit. The Mavericks defense as a whole looks like it has not missed a beat from where it was last year. And that, by the way, is great news. But people were kind of saying like, oh, man, this offense, it's a little bit it's a little bit concerning early on. Clay, Clay was cooking a little bit early on. Uh, like I said, forced a couple shots early on, but he still still was doing pretty well for the first half. And uh, Jaden Hardy came in and had his real spark plug moment. We'll get into that in a minute. But other than that, everybody else kind of struggled. Like Clay's, Clay and uh, Kai, I think between them had like seven and eight points at the half. Luka had like nine or something like that. Like they were not doing a lot in the first half. And Luka in particular just did not have it offensively in the first half. People were saying like, oh, Here's here's your concern right here, right? Like, oh, as, as great as Luke is now focusing on the defensive end. Oh, where's the offense? Like, dude, he didn't play the entire preseason. I don't I don't care how hard he went in practice, you know, once he was cleared, but he's going to have rust and you are working in a new component. I, I will also say this. 
the amount of off ball movement is so beautiful to see right now. It's it, it's not like it's the most uh, that you see around the league. Like there's other teams that still do it better in my opinion. But what we saw in just that game last night is like, okay, if we're gonna incorporate more of this, and now we've got the, the offensive spread that we do in terms of playmakers, big shot makers, etc. This could be really, really interesting here. So you get you get Jaden Hardy, like I said, going off in the in that stretch there where he knocks in like nine quick points or something. Uh, you have Clay doing his thing. But other than that, the Mavericks offense is really ho-hum in the first half. They were actually trailing by two at the half. And I want to say they had less than 50 points. I I'm trying to remember the exact score off the top of my head. I want to say it was something like 48, 46. Um, I don't have that in front of me right now, but they they really struggled. So the fact that they pour in 120 points in only really one good half's worth of play is really nice. Is is definitely really nice to see. Uh, here it is, I just came across it. 49, 47 was the halftime score. And Dallas was shooting 35% from the field at that. The opportunities were there. The looks were there. They just weren't connecting. I, I want to say Luca was something like 5 of 14 at the half. But then you saw when it clicked into form. You saw there in the in the third quarter, Dallas ends up scoring the Spurs, outscoring the Spurs by nine in the frame. And you just get a blitz out of nowhere where it's a Klay Thompson three, a Kyrie three, a Klay Thompson three, a Luka, a Luka three. And it's in the blink of an eye, like two minutes of game time. All of a sudden it's a 12-0 run and it's like, Oh, okay, they flipped it on their head. That's that's the thing about it. Because people might say like, oh, well, Dallas is off ball movement and all this. They they don't know how to use Clay. This is not the right place for Clay to be. Bro, as if Dallas isn't gonna adjust to put him in positions he needs to be in. We've said before, Luca, since he came into the league, has made Dallas one of the best teams, if not the best team, definitely top two or three, um, at creating wide open looks. There's a reason most notable names or even middle of the road names play best with Luka in terms of their three point percentage. Their three point percentage raises up to a new level because he generates so many wide open looks for them. That really, really needs to be focused on. Like, of course, Dallas, for the kind of acquisition that Clay is, for what he's addressing, something that was badly exposed as lacking in the finals. Of course, Dallas was going to make adjustments for that. Also, just the gravity of Luka and Kyrie on the floor. Clay got a look in this game, and I want to say it was like his fourth made three, maybe, maybe it was his fifth, where he catches the ball, and I swear it's like 26 feet to the nearest defender. Luca's already literally pumping his fist, heading up the court. He's like, oh, it's over. It's, it's done. This this play is done. It's a clay three. Boom. Clay files his taxes, checks his email, you know, checks out, uh, checks out his stats. Like, okay, how are we doing here? How are we looking? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, you know what? Dribble. Splash. Easy. Easy peasy. I don't know the last time he's had a look like that. So the fact that you get Clay going six of 10 from three, scoring like 22 points, and he's getting looks that are just obscenely open like that. And I understand the Spurs, the last five years, you know, they had a great graphic on there during the game, something that I, I definitely didn't have, I don't think the full context or appreciation of. The Spurs in their first like 43 years of history only missed the playoffs four times. In the last five seasons, they've missed it five times. That's wild, and that really does speak to just the greatness of that franchise. As much as I hate them as a rival, I do respect them, uh, and, and you know you got to call it what it is. So I get it; they've been down, but they're going to be better than the 22 wins or whatever they were last year. Assuming Wimby is healthy, they're going to be better. And Chris Paul, you know, is what it is for what he is at this point for them. Harrison Barnes, very nice pickup. He torched Dallas in the first quarter. He had like 12 points. He was six of six to start the game. And I was sitting here going like, oh, so it's it's a Harrison Barnes revenge game right now then, huh? He's, he's never forgotten us trading him in the middle of a game and then sitting him on the bench uh, during that. And, and I remember that being like a really controversial thing at the time. But even still, uh, here's another great note here from Mark Folliwell regarding this game. Most points by a player in their first game with the Mavericks. Monte Ellis had 32, Christian Wood had 25, Kyrie had 24, KP had 23, and now Klay Thompson with 22.
two. Clay Thompson overall was seven of 13 from the field, six of 10 from three, also added seven boards. And uh, yeah, that's, that's six of 10 and seven threes, six of 10 from three and sorry, seven rebounds. It's a, it's a figure he only reached twice at all last season. Other great notes on that as well. Let me try and find that specific one here where it was a context of what he was able to bring to the table. What he was able to bring to the table. Something he hadn't done since like the 2018 season here. Here it is. This is from Landon Thomas on Twitter. Clay Thompson recorded his first game with at least six threes made and three steals since the 2018-19 season. So again, people saying, oh, Clay's washed. He's done. It's over. Bro looks like he's still got something going. Like, not just the ease of the looks he's going to get, not just the fact that he's going to be able to be less of a focal point of this team. He's going to be maximized more by being asked to do less, believe it or not. Okay. Also, just that ability, that, that craftiness to work with that. Uh, I, I think that is huge. His ability and willingness to adjust and really make that work, I think is going to go a long way for him. By the way, he did all this in 26 minutes. Not bad, not bad. Uh, I liked this tweet here from uh, Zach Nadu on Twitter. He says, going from Tim Hardaway Jr. to Clay Thompson is how I imagine orphans feel after getting adopted by rich parents. Yeah, 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 yeah. I kind of see that. I kind of see that. So yeah, it's really impressive to, to put into context here. If you want to look at the overall big three combination here, Luca, Kai, and Clay combined for 65 points, 20 rebounds, 13 assists, six steals and two blocks that is tough speaking of tough the next thing i want to talk about is derek lively because not only is the lively wimby matchup one of the most intriguing ones because he's one of the few guys that yeah he doesn't have the offensive gifts obviously that uh wimby does but derek lively with his size and physicality his length all of that is really able to challenge wimby in a way that not many guys in today's nba can yeah, Wimby had a couple moments early on. He got a nice swat on a, a baby hook attempt from Lively in the, I think it was the third quarter. And the announcers went, oh, you know, went all huge reaction for that, which was, I'm like, eh, it, was, it was a nice block for sure. But also, let's not forget, there were back-to-back -back possessions early on in this game where Lively clamped Wimby to the point where Wimby is traveling, trying to create separation. He gets called for like back-to-back -back travels trying to create separation from Lively because Lively is just all over him. So Lively coming off the bench. Yes, they stuck with that formula. Gafford as your starting center. Lively off the bench had 15 points, 11 rebounds, a career high six assists and shot 75% from the field. Not only that, I've talked about it before. His playmaking, his vision, his ability out of that pick and roll to make the right play, to catch the cutting man diving towards the basket, to find the right guy on the perimeter. His ability to operate at that high post is really top-notch stuff. Not a lot of great passing big men in today's game. Obviously, the premier ones, you're gonna have Jokic, but somebody that can just add that passing ability, that playmaking ability, and then just take what's there for him offensively is just fantastic. So I loved what we saw out of Lively in this game. The tough defense. He picked up a two or three fouls that I, I didn't really like in the last few minutes in, in garbage time. But overall, phenomenal performance for him. Really being disciplined, staying out of foul trouble despite taking an extremely difficult assignment. Really making his presence felt in this game as well. And uh, it, it's just... It's phenomenal. He, he was in full goblin mode here in this game and was just able to absolutely, absolutely tear it up. Landon Thomas adds some more context to that. It was his first 15, 10 and five game. He joins Luca and Dennis Smith Jr. as the only players in Mavericks history to record at least a 15, 10, five game in at the age of 20 or younger. He tied his career high in assist. I actually thought he said it, so apparently he tied it. And he's the only center in Mavs history with uh, multiple games of six plus assists. Damn. I guess I can't say plus because both times it was six, but you get the point. Derek Lively, phenomenal with what he was able to do in this game. 
And what he's bringing to the table is just something that is going to make this team incredibly hard to beat. Now, let me talk about another guy here and another key point that I want to make. What I loved about this game, even with the offensive struggles in the first half, 35% from the field, opportunities there, just not knocking them down. Luka laid a lot of bricks. P.J. Washington laid a lot of bricks. What this team has in terms of balance is otherworldly. Clay can still create his own shot a little bit. You know, his first bucket was a pull-up jumper. And that, that was when it was 6-2 to two San Antonio. And then he creates a pull-up jumper, gets a nice shooter roll on it. Very nice stuff. What you have in guys like Jaden Hardy, new, new three-year deal, $18 million, I believe. Phenomenal. Between Spencer Dinwiddie's preseason and Dante Exum breaking his hand. You know, we'll see when he's back in the mix. This is Hardy's opportunity here. The new deal really signaled to me like, all right, he's going to get his opportunity. And boy, did I feel like he really capitalized on that. For a guy that we desperately needed to emerge as maybe an X factor in those finals who simply did not. And you know what? I'm not going to hate on him. I'm not going to be too rough because his, his opportunities in his first two years really has been limited. During the tank run of the second half of his rookie year, he got a lot of opportunity. And then the next year, last year, first half of the season, he got a lot of burn and he was doing really good. And then deadline happened and suddenly his minutes vanished and evaporated until he basically started to break out. And I want to say the end of that OKC series and then the Timberwolves series in the Western finals. Those were his opportunities to really step out and shine to expect him to then go to Boston and do that with those limited reps. That that's asking a hell of a lot. I don't care how talented the kid is. So that was that was always going to be a big ask. But Dallas, with its balance, really brings a dynamic that's that's unquestioned. Luka played 36 minutes, by the way. If Luka's 36 minutes roughly per game this year, ooh, is that going to bode well for us later in the year and come playoffs? But Luka's ability to be everything you need. Two assists shy of a triple-double yet again. Uh, Kai and his ability for it. Kai had 15, 3, and 2. Kai was never asked to do a whole lot in this game. Love that. Love that. Like, by all means, Kai is one of those guys that you want for those big, crucial moments. Having him not have to go out and be like, hey, I need you to be like 24 plus points per game, uh, six or seven assists, you know, whatever. And not having to ask that of him and that kind of workload of him is going to bode well for you. Of course, I already talked about Clay being able to create his own shot. But what are you going to have off the bench? Jaden Hardy taking that opportunity between the new deal, between the, the circumstance of the other guys. Man, he... he delivered not only does he have those i want to say three threes and he ends up with 11 points not only does he get those three threes in the first half and, and a quick burst i always talked about this kid's got the ability to be instant offense off the bench and you know again there's a little bit of murmurs about like hey man could this guy have like kind of six man potential this year i had him as a dark horse for that last year and that ended up being painfully wrong unfortunately but i still think the ability is there what really impresses me about him and the reason I'm so high on his stock right now is because of the playmaking ability. His two-man game, his chemistry with Derek Lively in particular, good googly moogly. So many times coming off a pick and roll situation, he found Lively rolling to the basket and not, not, not throwing down alley-oops. He was just making crafty, great vision passes, setting up Lively point blank at the rim. Uh, for for just an easy layup or an easy dunk opportunity like those kinds of plays that kind of vision is phenomenal he, he had another one where he creates he gets a steal creates a fast break and then sets up lively on the break for a, a jam like that stuff is it is so invaluable to have on your team don't be wrong Spencer will have some kind of role, I think, with this team. And if nothing else, during the stretches of the year where whether it's because of injury or because of just load management, that favorite phrase that everybody has in today's modern NBA, you'll have to lean on a guy like Spencer Dinwiddie. And having his experience and his pedigree will matter. However, Jaden Hardy, I think, really staked the claim this is his opportunity. He is the first guard off the bench. He has this ability to be instant offense, to be a tremendous playmaker. And you know what? Like, it's just something that's it's hard to replicate. That guy that has that spark plug ability, that kind of three point shot and what he's developed to his game, that playmaking ability and particularly his chemistry with Derek Lively, I think is just oof, it's so nice. It's so nice. 
you know, looking back just a couple years at this team and thinking like, man, when it had to be Luca or nothing, and then for a while it had to be Luca, Kai or nothing, and now it's like, okay, Clay can still create his own shot a little bit and still be a steady hand. Uh, Jaden has shown himself capable of that and still needs some seasoning, but the, the ceiling I think is very high on that in, in terms of like us talking about maybe he's a trade deadline candidate. Maybe, but at the same time, I, I'm i inclined to think he's going to be not this year. If it happens, it's got to either be a big, big something, which I don't think they probably need, or it would have to be the subsequent year. Um, his ability, what he can add, Spencer, again, is just a steady hand off the bench, just a break glass, break glass in case of emergency type option. And then what you have with some of these other pieces as well, like... You have the ability to spread it around without force feeding it, without being too one dimensional and predictable as you've had to be in the past. This is not give Luca the ball and clear the hell out, maybe spot up for three. This is not let Kai do it and let Luca and the other guy stand off ball and wait for something to happen. This is a much more balanced offense where it's like, all right, cool, man, you get your run for a while. Cool, Luca's gonna create, he'll set up. All right, now this guy's gonna come in and he's gonna wreak havoc for a minute. Now this guy's gonna come in, now this guy's gonna come in. Like, your ability to distribute that load is so crucial at this point. Run through the box score here for the Mavericks. Luca had 28, 10, and 8. Clay had 22, 7, and 3. Derek Lively, I already said, 15, 11, and 6. Kai had 15 points, three boards, two steals. PJ Washington, a little ho-hum performance for him on the game, but he had 11 and six all the same, including he, he, my favorite play for him is simply that he converted that three that Luca gets bumped like four times coming up the court between Wimby and uh, Chris Paul, and then jumps up, looks like he's dead to rights, somehow flips the ball over his shoulder, over Wimby's head, which... 7-3 flipping the ball over his head. It's like, wow, how did you not bean him right in the face? That's impressive in itself. Whips it over Wimby's head to the blind corner for P.J. Washington for a spot up three. And I'm like, dude, these passes aren't like just routine, routine for Luca, but like they're pretty common to see. But the difference is like, all right, man, is this going to make like a, a major highlight thing that we hang on to for a while? Because P.J. is going to splash this or is it going to be like a, a brick or something? We're going to be like, ah, oh, dang. That would have been awesome. No, he splashed it, and it, it was a it was a nice look. So it really completed that. I'm glad we're gonna get to see that clip flip uh, floating around for a while because of that. So love that. Uh, I really like what Dallas has in terms of their overall nucleus. Now I will say a couple of guys that I still want to see more out of uh, Grimes. I, I think Quentin Grimes has a lot more to offer this team than what we got a glimpse of in, in this first game. I'm not going to look at him and say like, oh, dude, this is the guy or this is the difference maker. I, I think that's a little hyperbolic, but I think it's just another one of those things where it's like, hey, man, if we're looking at depth and we're looking at a guy who can get hot and have a nice little stretch maybe for you at certain times in the year, that's not bad. That's a good pickup, especially when you consider that was your return for the Tim Hardaway Jr. deal. So, yeah, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that every time and twice on Sunday. Like. I think he's got a lot more to offer. I don't think we scratch the surface. And then uh, Najee Marshall is the other one. Like, I didn't really notice Marshall too much in this game, which is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a, it's a good thing in terms of defense because it means, all right, steady, not getting beat a lot. And in terms of offense, it's like, all right, I didn't notice him much there. But like, again, the role he's having to replace is Derek Jones Jr. And when you would notice Derek Jones Jr., more often than not, it would be because of an athletic play, like a, a crazy dunk or a block shot, something like that. And those are great. Those are electric moments. I, I still do miss uh, Derek Jones Jr. But again, for, for the scramble mode you had to make, for the change you had to make, I think you did the best you could and made a very, very good pickup in the process. So I love all of that. I think those guys are definitely ones to not be discouraged about that they struggled a little bit in this first outing with the with the Mavericks but I think at the same time they're gonna have a lot more opportunities to show what they can do and I think it's gonna bode very well for Dallas as well uh connecting back here Dallas ran away with this game in this in the second half I know the Spurs made a run Dallas went up like 14 or so in the third quarter when they started pouring on the blitz Spurs cut it all the way back down to three I think it got down to like 71 68 and uh, then Dallas pretty much said, start of the fourth quarter, like, all right, that's cute. We're done. That's usually how the modern NBA goes. In most cases, I know Boston just put an absolute beating down on the Knicks in their opener. 
but most of the time you're gonna have like the good team and the okay not there yet team or even subpar team are usually gonna be fairly even for a while and then at some point the difference is the good team is gonna say like all right that's cute let's let's finish this and that's what happened fourth quarter started dallas just said all right see ya it's been it's been real love love how this team puts it away garbage time makes it look a little closer you look at it and say oh, like oh it was only 11. It, it was really more like 20 the entire really almost the entire second half but dallas handled their business did exactly what you would want to see the questions about clay and how he can fit with luca and kai ridiculous i uh, love seeing that put to rest at least for one night for a first test everything you wanted to see they did absolutely pass obviously it's game one of 82 so we got a long ass way to go before we even get to playoff basketball or anything like that but for some of these people who still want to be contrarian still want to be critical and doubtful of the the potential and the fit and all of that i.e charles barkley i don't care I, I truly don't like i do not care because they're always gonna have doubters you got Barkley out there after the game saying, I think the Mavericks got lucky last year because of matchups. I think Dallas is the bottom of the West, maybe six, seven, or eight seed. Bro, all I'm going to say on this, the Mavericks in their run had to beat the number one seed, the Thunder, the number three seed, the Wolves, and the number four seed, all of which, the Clippers, all of which they did not have home court advantage for, and all of which they dispatched of, um, you know, they could have beaten the Clippers in five, ended up being six. Could have beat the Thunder in five, ended up being six. Could have swept the Timberwolves, ended up being five. Bro, they stood on business. I understand some people are, by the way, on that phrase, I understand some people are kind of tired of hearing us say, standing on business as if it's our whole identity. I don't care, man. You know, if they stick with it beyond this year or beyond the first little stretch of this year even, then I'm going to start to say like, OK, I'm, I might be there with you. But like for right now, bro, just treat, give yourself an identity, like treat that as an identity. Like, yes, we know on floor your defense, your your offensive barrage that you're going to throw out there. Great. Phenomenal. Love it. But have some sort of identity. I'm not saying it's a good one in the case of this next example. But the Thunder, the young Thunder team with their whole like, oh, dogs, blah, 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 like dumbass. I, I hate that. I hate that. I grant that. But I do appreciate the fact that your team has this sort of collective identity. So when you got all these team photos and you got Luca and Kai and these other guys recreating PJ's standing on business pose, I'm like, dude, I love that because it's taking PJ, this guy who, you know, setting aside even just him being the hometown kid sort of thing. You're taking this guy that has been sort of at this periphery and you're bringing him into the center and saying like, nah, this might not be like the dude for us by any means, but like he's almost like a cultural center of this team and its identity. I love that. That's how you build like a more conclusive thing. That's how it's not like, hey, this team is, it's Luca's team and everybody else is just living in his world or Luca plus Kai's world and everybody else is just living in it. I, that's where I feel like you don't have the cohesiveness where the chemistry is not there, where it's not a one for all, all for one sort of thing. This is how you kind of build those bridges with those other guys. And, you know, for the Mavericks previously with uh, with Brunson before he emerged, when he was the, the six man off the bench, but he was the guy leading like, hey, the vibes are immaculate. All that stuff is like that resonated. That made him sort of a cultural point, center point for that team in the locker room. So I kind of view this in a similar way, even though PJ is a starter and even though he is a big piece of what this team is, I think that's still very important. So standing on business, no issues with it at all. But the idea that guys are going to look at this and say, like, oh, the Mavericks got lucky. Bro, you can only play who's there. Saying somebody got lucky. Look, I know Boston was probably going to beat anybody last year, no matter the circumstance. But let's not act like Boston didn't get a cakewalk of historic proportions to the finals last year. They didn't have to play Butler. They didn't have to play Halliburton. They didn't have to play. Um, well, I mean, like we I'm trying to remember the exact list, but like when you look at all the superstars, key players in every round of their playoff march that they got to avoid, at least for part of the series, if not altogether, it really is just unbelievable <laughs> that they were, that the bullets they dodged uh, for that. So 
they never had to get the stress and strain. They didn't have to worry about like, hey, we got to rush this guy back like KP or whatever. We got to rush him back a little bit if we can or do whatever. They just could take their sweet ass time and do as they pleased. That's that's like really understated. But they don't get criticism for that because they ended up winning the title. So people say, hey, it doesn't matter. Well, Dallas lost. So it is what it is. Yeah, they did. And they got they got curb stomped. True story. Like, I'm not going to hide from that. I'm not going to run from that. But at the same time, I know they were really close in two of those two of those other games. So ball breaks a little bit differently or one play made here or there. It's the difference of losing in five versus this could have been a really grinded out six game series trying to force a game seven. It doesn't seem so far away. And now you look at what they've added in the case in the case of Clay Thompson, the three point shooting that they've added to the mix, uh, adding in more guys that can play off the ball or sorry, not play just off the ball, but actually run things for you a little bit. Your depth is better. You get some of these trigger happy guys off the team um, that did more harm than good most nights, i.e. Tim Hardaway Jr. And uh, it, it just it's a better Mavericks team than you had last year. And that's not that's not arguable. So like these people who want to say these things, they're going to look at it and they're going to say, like, well, look where the Mavericks were before they got hot late last year. Yeah, they were a different team. They were a different team. It, it, night and day, totally different. So yes, what we've seen of this team in its current makeup, and, I, and when I say that, I'm going to stay with the, the trade deadline last year from that moment in February, early February, to where we are now. How many teams have performed better? One. One. Is that, is that an argument? Is that a debate? I, I watched... I watched what happened with Denver and OKC last night. Denver's not better. Denver got worse. Their bench, completely unimpressive. OKC, to their credit, they look like they got better too. But you know what? I expected that. Now, Indy and I ended up not being able to post. We did a great about hour-long chat the other day and just technical issues just spiked the audio, completely ruined it, so I didn't get to post it. But we talked about this at length. Like, Dallas, from a talent perspective... Where we're like, injuries hold up. I think this is the top three team in the West. I think OKC still has their stake to the claim, being their age, their experience now, and the fact they were already the number one seed last year. I think, and, and what they did in the offseason, I'm like, I think OKC, Dallas, and I think we put the Timberwolves as the other team to kind of watch. Now, that was moments, I believe, before we had the cat for Julius Randle trade happen. So that obviously changed the equation there. But I really look at this team, this Mavericks team, and I say like, bro, I'll run this against anybody. You know, Boston might still be the better team because they are a super team. But even still, I would run this squad against anybody. And it's not even close. Like, I think this team, health permitting, is phenomenal. Derek, Derek Lively is going to be a perennial all-defensive team star. He's going to have all-star ability if he adds even a modest three-point shot to his uh, game, which we're seeing glimpses of. I think his ceiling is everything that I said it would be. I said he would be Tyson Chandler with a jump shot eventually. Bro, I already see it. I said from the moment they drafted that kid, that's what I saw. And a lot of people said I was insane. And now we're seeing it from his impact standpoint. The best thing the Mavericks ever did, even though it was the most controversial at the time, was tanking those two games. Because holy shit, the transformation for this team began with the drafting of Derek Lively. Yes, you can say like re-signing Kai, of course. Trading for Kai and then re-signing him, yes. But the transformation where we went from like, bro, we're just fighting for our lives to make the playoffs or make the play-in to, all right, now we're real talk, we're serious here. Then you make those deadline trades for Gafford and PJ Washington, and the entire thing took off. And from that moment to today, man, this is this is one of the most stacked teams. Like the work Nico Harrison did in his last two or three years is just phenomenal. Like it is mind boggling to think of where this team was just a little over a year ago to where it is today. Like it is in all the best ways, almost unrecognizable. It, um, I'm so thrilled with the direction of this team. And I really do think this is going to be an exciting year. But we'll see. You always got to play it out. On paper, a lot of things can always look great. You got to see how things play out 
And uh, this was just test number one of 82. Plus you got a postseason to look at. But for now, seeing the vibe, seeing how light and joyful Clay looked last night, seeing how fluid he looked and capable still on the defensive end he looked, seeing how the Mavericks defense really gave San Antonio trouble. And again, until garbage time allowed the Spurs to crack 100, really looked for a minute where it was just a dominant defensive performance. Seeing how uh, Wimby, man, he was like five of 17, four of 17 to start. Now you could say part of that's just an off shooting night or whatever, but like Mavericks were throwing a lot of stuff at him and they were giving him fits. They were causing him problems. You got all those things going on. Mm, that's, that's some premium shit. That's the difference of a good team and a great team, I think. This Mavericks team can beat you any number of ways, and they have depth and talent that'll rival pretty much anybody in the league. Uh, there might only be one team right now I take over them. So, we'll see. Let me know in the comments. How do you, how'd you feel about the game last night? How are we feeling today as we look at the Mavericks' start to their season? Don't forget to drop a comment, leave a like below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace!